For the past week, my introduction has simply read, Jonathan Lethem is freaking awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I ran this by several of my coworkers, and while we agreed that it was accurate, it was not really an introduction. Um, so let me tell you that booksellers have a special fondness for Lethem, as he is one of us. And I think it shows. The love of words and a full sense of the history of both books and human folly show in his work. After reading Motherless Brooklyn years ago, I closed the book and sat for some time sort of staring, a bit stunned, um, as my mind processed all I witnessed from an armchair. After finishing his recent collection, The Ecstasy of Influence, I had the urge to high-five the book because the curiosity and enjoyment that radiates from its pages is so often missing from a world of criticism bent on finding holes rather than embracing art. Dissident Gardens is this latest novel we are here to hear from and celebrate tonight. Spanning three generations and its ranging pop culture and hits, uh, it happens to hit this bookstore sweet spot, somewhere between communism and disillusionment, filled, filled with feisty matriarchs. Uh, the fanatic left is under the microscope in this, and under his fantastical eye in Gardens. These characters uh, saw their way through time and each other's lives, giving us their personal stories behind our recent history's greatest and perhaps most confused moments. Lethem is a professor, a MacArthur Fellow, New York Times bestselling novelist, short story writer, New Yorker, father, essayist, and according to the interestingly Wikipedia-linked uh, description on his website, a survivor of a hitchhiking expedition from Colorado to California. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming the multi-talented Jonathan Lethem. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much. Um, so um, I'm going to um, read from right in the middle of this very, um, uh, well, it's a book that's uh, kind of centrifugal in its structure. It's, it's, it's over a whole bunch of decades. Can everyone hear me OK? Um, and um, it has a lot, of, a lot of viewpoint characters. There's really two characters that are the heart of the book. And this will be all, all about one of them, and the other will be mentioned. And that is uh, Rose who is um, a generation uh, such that she's part of, you know, 30s, um, 30s communism and her daughter uh, who's born in the middle of World War II and therefore is the exact right age to kind of run away to the new left, to Greenwich Village specifically, uh, away from Queens where Rose has been living and, um, and become part of the folk scene. Um, so Miriam and Rose are really at the, center of this whole big, big mess. What I'm reading to you from, and I won't get very far into it, but I'll just get it going, is a chapter uh, called Cities in Crisis, where Miriam, the, the, the hippie, uh, goes on a game show in New York City. Um, she's, a, she's kind of a, a memory prodigy, and all her friends tell her that she ought to go and just make a buck uh, on one of these quiz shows. And so she goes on a show called The Who, What, or Where Game, which is recorded up at, well, you know, the Rockefeller uh, Center, uh, NBC Studios now, so, so famous as 30 Rock, same place. Um, and, this, and I think that, you know, you'll hear a lot of names coming in and out of here. Rose, her, her mother will get mentioned, and, and her, her, her best friend is thought about quite a bit. Um, Stella Kim is reminisced about quite a bit in this section. Um, but but she doesn't appear. And this is just uh, the beginning of her experience on the game show. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll read a bit of this and then I'll stop and take some questions um, from you guys. The Green Room. The young NBC production assistant greeting Miriam Gogan as she disembarks Rockefeller Center's Studio 6A elevator is an unmistakable freak in containment. Eyes pinwheel spinning his pleasure at being recognized as such above a Van Dyke beard, and lips as soft and red as a teenage boy's. She supposes the recognition is mutual, for though Miriam has pinned her shoulder blade length frizz into a neat castle perched high off her neck, and selected from the depths of her closet the canary yellow pantsuit retained for appearances at civic forums, public bureaucracies, and bail hearings, also donned modest jade earrings and an unchunky silver necklace, she doubts this straight costume cloaks her own pot-drenched pupils, dilated to meet you at one in the afternoon. The assistant invites her into the program's green room, reminding her as they go that though today is Tuesday, 
taping has already been in progress, would just now be finishing on a Thursday segment of the Who, What, or Where game, the quiz show on which Miriam Gogan has been selected to be a Friday contestant. They film, he explains this as they move past reception, through glass doors, into the corridor, they film the episodes in bunches, two on a Monday, then three on a Tuesday, keeping the host, Art James, from having to work for more than two days to put a week of shows in the bank. This also saves on hotel nights for the episode Champions, who reappear on the panel the day following their victory, carrying over for as long as a week before the show resets with three fresh contestants every Monday. So, if they hurry inside, Miriam can watch on a video monitor Thursday's final round. Pot Limit is the name of it in the, sh- in the show's language, and judge the play of the winner, who will be her opponent when she steps onto the set. The other new player, Miriam's future opponent too, is waiting already in the green room, but according to this kid, he doesn't look any too formidable. An accountant, a nobody. It is today's likely winner she ought to worry about, Peter Matusevich, a hipster advertising man. He'd begun on Monday, yesterday that was, and had been winning all week. The goofy bearded boy in a suit babbles this way at her as he leads her into the foam-insulated and carpeted chambers of the inner studio, his apparent injunction to make the contestants comfortable melding effortlessly with stoner palaver, that droning fascination with everything. Here were the restrooms. Miriam must know a hell of a lot about current events to get selected to be on the program. Too bad you can't see the Chrysler building from here. Did she want some coffee? The weird fudge of days that pertains in this place, Monday containing Tuesday, Tuesday containing all the rest, seems of a piece with the young assistant's fog of approximation. In a more general way, finding the sweet young head waiting here to meet her is all of a piece with Miriam's New York in the new decade. This is the beginning of the 70s. As though she's invoked him, smoked him into being. It was once the case that, in pursuit of such encounters, you migrated from the drab gray lands that extended in every direction, seeking a small enchanted quadrant, McDougal Street, Mott Street, Bleecker Street, a brick cellar on Barrow Street where a jazz trio's instruments lay gathering dust. Hipsterdom's tiny population glommed new members those days at an appreciable pace. Anywhere, anyone arriving on that postcard-sized scene had by all appearances grown, sign, grown sideburns just five minutes before seeking approval of the essential few who'd each personally gotten turned on by either Allen Ginsberg, Mez Mesro, or Seymour Krim. If back then you saw Tule Kupferberg or Ramblin' Jack Elliott on the street, you not only greeted them and were greeted in fond return, you knew that Elliott was as much a New York Jew as Kupferberg, an open secret to all but the squares who paid to see his cowboy shtick. A decade later, Greenwich Village has exfoliated its vibe outward, encompassing the whole island overnight. Sure, hippiedom had daubed the whole planet with its paisley virus, doped flower kids adrift and hitchhiking anywhere. <clears throat> but Manhattan's variation is more intricate and compelling. New Yorkers, a strain of the human species too consumed with mercantile striving to brook interruption, have, with typical acquisitive impatience, turned on without dropping out. Any given old format, say, like an NBC quiz program run out of Rockefeller Center, now bleeds with dressed-up freaks along the lines of this kid. No fuck-ups, they carry the city's tasks forward with as much alacrity as the type of go-getter they replaced, even if in wry quote marks. Peter Matusevich, the advertising executive who is the week's champion so far, plainly shares in the same benign conspiracy. Miriam, seated now in the comfy oasis of the green room with the assistant and the accountant, studies her soon-to-be opponent on the video monitor there. Matusevich is outfitted in a wide-lapelled mint suit, sports an elegantly waxed mustache, not so large as to be silly, keeps his longish hair combed neatly over both ears, and speaks in tones both insinuating and sweet while he eliminates the previous pair of who, what, or where game opponents as though wishing to convert the tiny violence of their dispatch into a kind of seduction. As soon as this operation is completed, Matusevich enters the green room in person, and Miriam enjoys another easy exchange of mutual recognition. 
this at a higher level than the older sisterly affection she'd granted the assistant. Matusevich really is a fox. Even if Madison Avenue is basically satanic. Not that Miriam is shopping. I should say now, uh, what I failed to in the setup, Miriam is married, has been married for 10 years to an Irish folk singer named Tommy Gogan. That's why her last name is Gogan instead of a, uh, more, something more Jewish. So she's, she's more or less happily married. Not that Miriam is shopping, except in that, yes, older sisterly way she shops on behalf of the single chips, chicks of the commune. Stella Kim, for instance. It is Stella, her current best friend, with whom Miriam had gotten high just before taking the subway up to Rockefeller Center, and Stella, who's volunteered to keep an eye on the toddler while Miriam competes on the show. Tommy, the loving dad, having flown the coop again. Reverting to Woody Guthrie, a man of his people who couldn't stay home, he'd picked today to journey by train up the Hudson River to play a set to bolster the spirits of the ragged band of Quaker protesters keeping a death penalty vigil at the prison in Ossining, a thing Miriam liked to call his gig of Sisyphus. Though that might actually describe Tommy's whole last decade. His career, which Miriam, having made herself staunch behind, the great every woman behind every great man, tries not to consider. But Stella Kim would, for instance, dig Peter Matusevich very much. And likely the reverse, Stella Kim being a fox herself, Stella Kim being really somewhat special, really quite a lot more than another of Miriam's dopey commune girls. For it is generally the case that Miriam, having surpassed the dread age of 30, mother of a two-year-old, collects to herself living emblems of her earlier self, even if they are mostly without a clue, contain barely a notion behind their brush-shined waterfalls of hair. Nevertheless, Miriam enfolds them within her sphere, plays older sister and girlfriend, purveyor of good grass and serious knowledge, to the barefoot and thank Christ for the pill, not pregnant, lilies of the counterculture. These subject, if they are lucky enough, to the special ironic burden of those subject, if they are lucky enough, to the special ironic burden of the chauvinist hippie boyfriend. At least Tommy Gogan, her husband, is Irish, is famous, or had been, and has donated his fame and other more material prospects to great causes, alibis unavailable to the hordes of ponytailed schlubs still looking to their chicks for laundry duty. So many of these are NYU girls, or dropouts from Bard or Vassar or Stony Brook, come awash in New York. Good ch churchgoers right through high school, members of monkeys fan clubs, tentative abusers of bathroom cabinet amphetamines, victims generally of the stupefying effects of the suburbs. Miriam, their usher to the city, unveilable, uh, excuse me, unveiler of its occult corners, would have older sistered most of these types even when she was 17, fresh from dropping out of Queens College. But Stella Kim, Bronx born hunter graduate, survivor of another staunch red mother, and self savvy hot ticket, Stella has the capacity really to show Miriam to herself eight years younger or so Miriam would like to believe. They'd met at, at Yippie headquarters during a meeting for a call to solidarity with Cesar Chavez, Miriam honing in on Stella's fitful intensity even before the, before the girl bummed a smoke. Waste of time, Miriam told her as they left the meeting early, to snag falafels and amble to the park. I haven't touched iceberg lettuce for a year now, big news. Boycott's too slow, let me show you. She guided Stella to the Associated on 8th Avenue. Do they have that here? It's a name of a New York uh, uh, inner urban um, supermarket chain. She guided Stella to the Associated on 8th Avenue, where they smoked dope behind the dumpster. Then, once inside, loaded their handbaskets with heads of iceberg and bunches of migrant exploiting grapes. Around a corner, when no one looked, they excavated an open casket freezer and buried the lettuce and grapes beneath pounds of plastic bags of frozen peas and carrots. Only takes about 10 minutes in the ice to wreck the lettuce, she explained. They might still be able to sell the grapes, but they sure won't taste right. Cool, exclaimed Stella Kim, impressed for certain. But what's the baby food for? A baby? Come on. She dragged her home to show off Sergius and Tommy. Sergius is the two-year-old. 
No feminist shame in the nuclear family, leastwise not on a night when Tommy had stayed home trying to tease into place between the inf infant's lips a bottle, stand in for her laden breasts, which began jetting in instantaneous response the moment she and Stella walked through the door to hear the father pleading with the bawling child. Stella Kim, unflappable, introduced herself to Tommy and then, with a sly smile, produced an extra couple of glasses, glass jars of Gerber, apparently booted into her macrame purse while Miriam paid for those she'd taken to the register. There are few tricks you can teach this girl, who conveys a certain weather underground vibe she'd acknowledge only in cipher remarks, passing behaviors. It is Stella, in fact, who has taught Miriam to use slugs for subway tokens. Matte discs punched from rolled steel. Stella, who with enough of these in, in that purse of hers to cold cock a policeman, has gifted Miriam with handfuls. Miriam used one of the slugs to ride the F train to the Rockefeller Center Studios today. It was with Stella Kim that Miriam, the famous rememberer, the memorizer of factual nonsense, one day found herself calling out her own long bluff and writing into the game show to become a contestant. Miriam's absurd ease with dates and names and geography so impresses her cohort, though this aptitude feels to her merely her legacy under Rose's nurture. Rose, who would barely settle for, settle for less, and a skill Miriam truthfully finds less amazing in herself than she finds it amazingly lacking in her husband and his friends and her friends too. It was Stella with whom she sat at home, caring for the kid with a television on, calling out answers to the game show's questions an instant before each contestant can do so, could do so. And it was Stella's exhortation, why not win some of their funny money if you already know the answers anyway, that she jumped for a pencil and scribbled down the address. All it takes is a postcard with your name, address, and telephone number to the three W's, P.O. Box 156, New York, 10019. It is Stella who understands how badly they could really use the money. While Tommy remains stranded in a valley between recording contracts, a valley Miriam secretly fears may not, in fact, prove crossable. Okay, I'm going to just jump because there's something I want to get to, and, and, then, and then I will be really happy to uh, stop. So, um, yeah. This this is this is what I had in mind. It, it gets us to Washington D.C. <clears throat> so now skip a couple of things. She's just now set, stepping onto the set, which really, I, as I say, I'm going to barely get you into the scene. She's just thinking so much in the course of getting there. Stepping, she's she's high. <laughs> stepping onto the set of the show, she watches five times a week is as strictly surreal for Miriam as it would be to locate her own face among those in the collage of famous characters surrounding the Beatles on the jacket of the Sgt. Pepper's LP. The who, what, or where game set is a kind of florid proscenium on which the three contestants are mounted like products in a display window, seated before a blue curtain woven with twinkling tinsel. Why has Miriam never noticed this before? The scoreboards are all set to $125, the sum the program spots each of its contestants at the outset, in order that they are able to make their first bets. The announcer now briefly explains the rules, how each contestant must judge from the name of a given category, whether their preferences for puzzling at the who or the what or the where of the matter, and then select a dollar amount to bet on the result. The studio audience, concealed behind blinding spotlights, is a distant hum, easy to dismiss. Miriam is, on the other hand, too conscious of her proximity to Peter Matusevich and Graham Stone, the sole female she's been seated between them, and so, as at a dinner party, feels responsible to the vibrational neediness of the men at either side. While the theme music plays unaccountably loud, each opponent leans in to wish her luck. Stone does this friskily, bearing incisors, compensating for his husky body and brow. Matusevich does it with a vulpine mournfulness that pretends to be sorry he intends to eviscerate her as he has all previous opposition. The announcer intones, who, what, or where? That's the name of the game. And here's your host, Art James. James welcomes the players, introducing them in the standard manner, according to their place of residence and their profession, or in the case of housewives, with some anecdote obtaining from a hobby or interest. Miriam, on being screened for the show, had offered herself as activist, 
and suggested they mention her having been wrongfully arrested on the steps of the US Capitol during the May Day protests. Though many hundreds were arrested that day, Miriam enjoys counting herself as among the, quote, Capitol Steps 13, for it is in a cell of 13 women that she found herself detained, and with those 13, freed on bail by the ACLU lawyer 36 hours later, having for that time shared a single toilet in full view, and proudly too, and having shared the solidarity of refusing the only food offered them during that time. The guards brought bologna sandwiches, and the 13 prisoners, not so much defiant as giddy, stripped the bologna from the moist white bread in which it was entrapped and slapped the slimy stuff against the glossy gray wall of the cell where it stuck. One or two discs unpeeling to droop to the cell's floor before the prisoners departed, but most remaining glued there, meat graffiti. Political speech formed of animal product and binders, salt and enzymes. Of course, her breasts had been leaking too, through that whole incarceration, and during the drive back in Stella Kim's hippie boyfriend's black Dodge, which had a chunky fist painted on the hood, and in the back seat of which she and Stella had curled together and doped and devoured a meatball sub sandwich and giggled and then slept, but not before Miriam revealed to Stella the soaked disaster of her bra beneath her t-shirt and told how she'd been daubing her nipples with the cell's rough toilet paper whenever no one watched. Fuck the bologna sandwiches. You could have fed the lot of us, said Stella. That's revolting, said Miriam. You would think Miriam should be a lesbian, and more than a few times she joked aloud that she'd wished she'd been able to explore in that vicinity, but the truth was she met a brick wall waiting for her there. Miriam found breasts in particular quite disgusting. They reminded her of her mother's body. The great secret glory of her arrest, and which she'd not confessed even to Stella Kim, had zilch to do with B-movie, ladies' cell block fantasies, but instead what it had in common with her voyage just now up to Rockefeller Center to be on the show, time away from the kid. A non-negotiable interval in which she could pass Sergius off to Tommy and regain the autonomous contour of herself for an hour or two. Just, just breathe free of her own ceaseless mothering of the boy, the claustrophobia of loving duty, a liberty the hunger for which Miriam would never enunciate fully, even to herself. And when she'd been given her one moment with a pay telephone in the jailhouse corridor, it was Rose she phoned, saying, get on the subway and go to Tommy and help, leaving the remainder unsaid, knowing it was as plain as the baloney on the wall. Go take care of my child, you organizer, you subversive, you unusual and ambivalent mother, because I'm in jail. You communist who loves cops, look what I've done. I'm in jail where you dared me to go. I've gone in the name of your beliefs. You protested Hitler and you put my head in an oven. Now go hate, help take care of my kid because I'm in jail. Today, Miriam finds herself rewritten. Art James, the host, says, Miriam Gogan lives in Manhattan, New York. She's a wife, mother, and community organizer. Welcome to the show. You know, when I was growing up, my mother was a sort of community organizer, too. She'd organized the community of, of me and my brothers to school each day. And believe me, it wasn't easy. My own context sort of touch on all those things. I mean, I grew up in that kind of family yeah. in the 50s. And I was an activist. And I yeah. was involved with other hippies in certain periods. But... I just wondered if you ever, I mean, you're a writer, right? But whether you ever experience frustration about seeing all these things in a, you know, interesting and clear way, whether you had a frustration about, besides writing, never being an activist yourself, mm. maybe you were, to yeah. do something about them. Well, yeah, I'm a, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I do come, this, this book is not a memoir, but I do come from a family where this is a kind of legacy and was one that I, I had in, inside, you know, kind of inside me in that way that uh, you don't question as a, as a child, it's just what your family does. So I would march a lot. And there's some, sometimes when I'm excusing my relative political passivity now, I think, well, I got it, you know, I, I put in the time practically before <laughs> I was at so many protests before I was even off to college that I'm still well in the black, right? But 
um, and you know, it was, I remember marching against the Vietnam War. That was the first kind of thing I, I remember. But I also, it seemed just to flow continuously into marching in favor of daycare centers in, at City Hall. Um, you know, a lot of uh, protests for, against nuclear power or nuclear, nuclear pro pro proliferation and kind of the Helen Caldicott era. I did that a lot and began doing that even, you know, uh, on my own with my high school friends, not so much in the company of my family. I, I, um, I, I go around feeling quite political to myself, but I, I don't mistake that for uh, necessarily a, uh, having a coherent presence as an activist in any way. I, I think I'm, in terms of being, being um, you know, articulating, let alone manifesting my, my views, I'm, I'm quite, uh, not, I'm not impressive. <laughs> And and you know and I would I would also take it one step further and say, uh, you know this book doesn't advocate. I mean if you it's not a it's not a call to anything. It's not me trying to compensate by writing a novel. In fact, it's really a book about characters, li the the lives of people who have given themselves in this way to this kind of feeling of wanting to transform the world. I mean, I, if you tried to march under the banner of this book, I don't know where you would go. You would just <laughs> stand frozen. Um, but you know, I think actually. Ironically, some of my earlier books, specifically one called Chronic City, do have contain a kind of real political, uh, in, the, in the case of that book, a real rage against a certain p moment in history. This book is more about um, taking the emotional uh, and psychological survey of what I, just also just witnessing, just saying these lives, these, these people have lived this way. You know, this, these things happened. Thank you. It doesn't all have to be so heavy. <laughs> you can ask me a small question, too. Hey. Hi. What do you think has happened to the left? Uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, in 25 words or less. Uh, yeah. I'm a federal worker. I'm not, yeah. I'm, I've got lots of free time now. <laughs> but, so, so you've got some, yeah. Yes, you should. But what do you think has happened? Well, I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a. I'm really not. I have very little capacity for like a comprehensive. Uh, uh, I'm not. I'm. Is you know. I don't. I haven't done historiography here, and I don't have a great snapshot of the the present situation for you. I would say that I'm just in researching this book, just to know enough to write about the lives I wanted to write about. I ended up with this feeling that the form the book took had to extend to the very present. You know, on the face of it, I was picking a historical subject, which is a strange leap for me. I've never written a historical novel before, and I felt very trepidatious about it, just in terms of putting politics aside now, just in terms of the difficulty of believing in my ability to inhabit these past eras. I mean, I find myself very hard to persuade when I read historical fiction. And so I really worried a lot about that. But so I suffused myself in lots of information and read a lot of things that, you know, things that, you know, I wouldn't even recommend necessarily. A lot of stuff that's been surpassed or overwritten, but it was vital at the time. So it gave a flavor of the intellectual life of the time. You know, I read a certain amount of stuff that was, you would now look at and you'd say, oh, propaganda. It's just that was history has totally eradicated that way of feeling or thinking about uh, history or politics. But what I did f start to feel was that I was writing about something that was, although I wanted to clarify it <laughs> by making a lot of descriptions of very particular historical moments, some of them very glorious ones for the left, some of them really appalling, that I was writing about something that w that not only transcended all those specifics, but really transcended the left. And it was that American life is made up of a continuity of um, utopian uh, gestures. Uh, that this place is really um, described in terms of a lot of different people feeling at odds with the world they've been given to live in and wanting to change it and, and live in a different one. And that that... Uh, made, you know, for instance, the American Communist Party much more continuous with both the history that, that preceded them and other parts of American life at the time and the present than 
all those specifics might seem to suggest. Now, you know, while I was writing the book, Occupy happened. And it was, there, there it was, you know, uh, you know, in a way calling my bluff. Okay, you're going to write this book about the left and bring it to the present. I guess now I have to name this thing that's happening and think, have a coherent thought about it. You know, and the, what was so fascinating was it seemed that almost every, Occupy managed to do everything the American left has ever done in like a tweet. It was like 140 characters, do the whole thing. All the triumphs, all the, re, all the powerful, uh, you know, uh, sweeping possibility, uh, factionalism, you know, self-destruction, you know, uh, every, every gesture. But I also ended up thinking a lot about that moment. You know, there it was in front of me, and I thought, there's a lot that, um, that uh, happened that, that's still alive, that's still happening. You know, it sort of um, seems to have uh, evaporated, and yet I think it's really tangible. It's in the way we, that people think and feel uh, now that that happened. You know, it, um, the most, the simplest way to put it is suddenly there was capitalism again because it had been named. It had been get re reacquired its identity so you could have something to oppose. It actually meant something to be anti-capitalist, you know, instead of um, it just being all bunched together with America and freedom and, you know, other unassailable things. Um, so I, I thought that was an amazing accomplishment that in a way is still sinking in. Uh, and I think, in a, you know, I, uh, this may seem a crazy remark, but I feel other radicalisms, other lefts are still sinking in. Their implications are still being worked through, even if they seem to have left their footprint, made some positive moves, you know, become... Uh, uh, you know, unsustainable as movements uh, become exposed or humiliated by certain, you know, uh, kinds of grandiosity or, or nihilistic action. I think actually their gestures are like occupies still alive, just waiting to be understood fully or in, in, interpolated into into you know the world completely. You know, and I get you know. I really am going on, am I not? Uh, I'll just I'll just give one example in 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 evidence of this rather esoteric suggestion I'm making, and that is that suddenly we're doing gay marriage. You know, it's like the the radical identity politics, so problematic, seen as by some as a form of fragmentation of the left in the '60s, but suddenly out pops you know this piece of overwhelming egalitarian truth that's just. It's here now, you know? So these stories aren't simple. Yeah, the present is certainly not. Hi. I'll, I'll try to change the mood. Great, do. <laughs> um, something I know how important music is to you, and you mentioned uh, Sgt. Pepper's in your, in your book. Yeah. And I was just wondering what your, your feeling is on this uh, movement in the music industry that there's so many bands that are touring as tributes to other bands, uh -huh. Bruce Springsteen, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd. Now there are bands going around with no names that are playing full albums, like at Strathmore Hall and Bethesda. Uh -huh. there, there's a band coming in to do Sgt. Pepper's. That's what got me thinking about it. Yeah. And there are all these other things. It seems like some clubs, and they're not playing small places, are booking more tribute bands and tr uh, note to note perfection of albums mm -hmm. then and people are going to see them just wanted to get your view on that well i it's interesting uh i don't exactly know all the symptoms that you're describing but what it reminds me of is stuff that i i believe is true of culture generally that i that i think about a lot and it's it's in this book in in a small way in that um there are characters like tommy the husband who are in the folk scene and then feel that the folk scene is sort of gets usurped by Dylan's appearance as this uh, individual songwriting genius when actually it's supposed to be a kind of egalitarian, you know, transmission that the whole idea of folk music is that everyone plays everybody's songs and they don't belong to anyone or they belong to everyone, you know, the kind of the more the Woody Guthrie image. And, you know, it's, it's funny you, you say that about the Beatles because one, you know, it used to be also even in pop and, and rock and roll and also, I guess, in jazz, everyone had to know, you know, these were dance bands. They were performing to entertain. And so when people showed up at the early rock shows, 
they didn't want to hear you know songs they didn't know they wanted to hear the songs that were on the radio and so every band knew how to play everybody else's hits and if somebody had a really big hit suddenly everybody had to be able to play it and the beatles themselves only learned to write songs because um their manager said that's where the money was what they did in their famous stint in the german cellars in those those beer gardens and and beer cellars in hamburg was play the entire history of rock and roll to that point elvis presley songs and Bo Diddley songs and Chuck Berry songs with incredible fervor and, you know, making them their own. But they were all they were playing all the recognizable numbers. So I'm I'm a, I'm I tend, even though here I am, a novelist is kind of the ultimate image of this sort of isolated Promethean artist, right? Just making their own thing and pre presenting it on a platter. But I love the aspect of the arts. And even when I can get there myself in my own art, that is kind of commie, kind of inter, inter uh, you know, intertextual and, and where there's a lot of borrowing and, and, and um, appropriation and reuse and, and repurposing. I, 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 so what you're describing doesn't sound bad to me, is what I'm saying. Thanks. Uh, um, so from between uh, writing worlds where animals speak to um, Tourette Noir to... Uh, more recently, I guess, activist women. How, how do you come up with your ideas? And furthermore, I mean, how do you can keep yourself committed to them for what I'm sure it takes years to flesh out and fold? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, when I was younger, I used to feel like I had ideas for like a hundred novels. Everything seemed like an idea to me, and I just couldn't imagine living long enough to write out even the ones that were like in my notebook at the time. Um, and. Uh, a lot of those would be very stupid books if I wrote them, in fact. But they seemed alive to me. And maybe I would have, you know, if I'd stuck at them, I would have developed them or deepened them in some way. Because on the face of it, a detective with Tourette's might sound kind of thin, too, when you just say those words. Or, or you know, um, or some of the even more frivolous sounding uh, descriptions of the earliest of my books. But the fact is, of course, I don't turn out to be that fast a writer. Um, it takes me about three three to four years to write a novel each time. And so the stories that do get told the one, are the ones that stick around and kind of just, uh, they, it's like I visualize them and instead of them just remaining thin or amusing, they kind of deepen, they accrue some, some kind of uh, texture, or other ideas or feelings, especially feelings attached to them, and they become personal. You know, really the books I've ended up writing even though the ideas are often quite um, seem remote from anyone's personal experience, they're um, they're they're they've become vehicles for things that I feel, for a kind of autobiographical energy, even if the facts have nothing to do with my life. So, at the rate that I actually write them, uh, you know, right now I feel like there are two or three ideas that are kind of alive in my imagination. The chances are, by the time I write even one of those. Uh, the others will have withered away. But I've usually lived with the story in my mind for for several years, for many years before I begin writing it. And it's taken on, for me, a kind of presence. It's not real. I have to, I have to make it real. But I feel like it's already real. And so what I'm doing is just delivering that image to others. Okay, uh, one more. Uh, so I'm going to be greedy and do three little ones. Okay. Um, uh, the first is, uh, I, I loved your review of Thomas Pynchon's new book, Thank and I you. wonder uh, if you have a favorite Pynchon novel. And uh, so that's one. Two is, uh, what was the inspiration for The Tiger in Chronic City? Yeah. And uh, three, it, did you play? Was there really a game? Uh, I never did this thing. You know, uh, what I, I have never. I, oh, I have never. That's like yeah. kind of a drinking game. And that's a real. Where did I write about that? Where did I put that? In a short story. In in. Uh, oh, is it the in the story of the Vision? Uh, I think yeah, it's in the Vision. vision. Right. Yes, that's a real game. Uh, oh, I'll tell you a story about that game because <laughs> no one, no one here is going to repeat anything I say, like on the internet or anything. No, it's not being recorded, and none of you ever Twitter or do anything like that. I once played so this drinking game that I wrote about in, um, uh, in um, in this short story called The Vision. It's a very simple kind of high schoolish thing but adults can obviously enjoy it too uh where so you're sitting and everyone's got a glass of whiskey or whatever the, the drink is and 
and someone says, in, you know, it's someone's turn, they say, I have never X. And what they're doing is, and they have to be honest, it has to be a thing they haven't done. Um, and, um, uh, and the people who have done that thing are sort of busted and they have to drink. So you're, 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 you're making people confess. The ones who take a drink are saying, I have done this. So it might be, I have never had sex on an airplane. And, and then you look and like two people kind of, you know, pretending to be embarrassed, but really completely feeling proud of themselves. So I once played this game in a circle of writers and other artists at a writer's colony called Yaddo. And, and this is a, really a DC story. One of the other people up there was Carl Bernstein. And he, he, he sat in with us. It was a nice cold night by the fireplace, and we were having a fun little toasty game. And, uh, and like the, I think the very first person said, I have never cheated on a spouse. And Carl goes, oh, come on. <laughs> um, so um, that's, that's the story. Uh, my, my favorite Pynchon novel, weirdly, I don't know if it's weird or not. I love V very much. Uh, I read it when I was really young. It was a New York book, and it evoked the mystery of the city I lived in, in a way, to me, that I think, in fact, Chronic City engaged with very directly. So I'm still sentimental about that one, which made it, the fact that he'd written about New York again, finally, because he's left it totally alone in the intervening years, in this new one, very interesting to me. So I'm glad you liked the review. What was your middle question? The oh, the tiger in, OK. So one last random thing for me, and then we'll stop. Uh, right, so that book, Chronic City, has uh, a lot of weirdness around the edges, kind of, just kind of a paranoid or um, distort, you know, looking glass version of New York City, but there are no, for the most part, there are no outright absurdities or fantastical things, except maybe there's this one thing where they're building the Second Avenue subway, which they are really doing, using underground drilling machines, and one of the drilling machines sort of escapes from the tunnel, and then again... Maybe it's really not a drilling machine. Maybe it's a giant escaped tiger, a tiger of the size of like a Japanese monster movie tiger. And it's prowling around the city, uncaught somehow, and ravaging sections of the city at night. And it was just a, an image that came for me from a couple of different sources. It was in uh, Borges, Dream Tigers, and it was in um, uh, a Kafka parable very short Kafka piece about jaguars. Uh, I can practically recite the whole thing from, from memory. Jaguars break into the temple at night uh, and knock over the urns and destroy the ceremonial objects. Um, this happens with such regularity that eventually the, the uh, destruction of the jaguars becomes the ceremony. It is expected, and this is, this is how we, this is how, you know, this is what the temple is for. Um, and, um, and then also a, a, a short bizarre novel by a writer named Charles G. Finney. He's famous, or to the extent that he's famous, or remembered, he's famous for his first novel, which was called The Circus of Dr. Lau. Uh, I don't see very many people nodding. It was made into a movie. It was He's kind of a Ray Bradbury type of writer. His second novel, which no one read at all except me, was called The Unholy City. And it's about a giant, uh, a giant megapolis that's being sporadically ravaged by an escaped tiger. And I felt that I could probably help myself to that image because you know, here we are. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm alive and Charles G. Finney is not. So, um, But it, yeah, it was just a beautiful, to me it, it said something that I still can't express any other way and so I don't, I don't have an explanation for it when people ask me to explain it, which is why I'm so glad you didn't ask me that. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Thanks. <laughs>